and I will go. Ladies and gentlemen, Meatloaf! Okay, so you notice I have a cane. Well, there's a re it's a really good cane, too, and, and really expensive. I sent my, I'll just tell you a little story about the cane. I was in London, and I'd had knee surgery, so my knee was hurting. Come on in, take a seat, and be sure to drop your $10 in the uh, uh, bread basket <laughs> so we can all have bread. So anyway, can we close the doors? Who, can we close the doors? As soon as the people, you come on in. You guys are from that TV show. Where are you going? <laughs> something, something she said? She's sorry. Okay, so anyway, the cane, I sent my assistant to buy me a cane, expecting she'd go to like, you know, a drugstore and get me a, you know, $15 cane, right? No, she got me a 750 pound cane. That's not how much it weighs, that's how much it cost, <laughs> which is about $1,500. But it's, but I tell you what, it, it's really a good weapon, so don't fuck with me. <laughs> so anyway, I know everybody's always got these questions. What are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah, it's really good. But you can pick up that water, it's great. And the cane, don't worry about that right now. I just got to get close. I don't, who in the heck? Why would they put them way back there? You still, you see, you still got the light. And the camera still works. It just takes me a second. So, I haven't, what, there you go. I haven't worked in five years because I've had four back surgeries. And, um, well, I did. I did one little thing. I had one back surgery, did all that rehab work. And then I did a, a, a series that didn't, didn't go very well with Vincent D'Onofrio. But Vincent D'Onofrio is a real deal, man. He's fantastic. So it was called uh, Ghost Wars. Yep. Oh, you saw it? See, that one person saw it. Thank you for watching that. That, 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 was, uh, that was the ratings, one. And um, so anyway, I hadn't worked and then... I've been doing all the physical therapy, right? All the physical therapy. Where are you, why do you keep doing with your white hats, man? Coming in, leaving, going, coming in. I'm gonna steal the white hat, you come back in. So anyway, um, so I go to Dallas and I'm doing photos and I'm getting ready to go to my panel and I walk up on the stage and it's about this thing, and they have a curtain over it, and there's a chair they'd had a movie in, and I just flat fell and fractured my collarbone right here into my sternum, and I was in the hospital for a month, and they wouldn't, I couldn't move. They wouldn't let me move for a month. Now I'm moving, and it hurts like hell when I do, so, because people have been grabbing at me. So anyway, but the questions that people usually ask me are the following. How did you get your name? <laughs> right? I know. How many people have thought, how did he get his name? Raise your hand. What, you never, what, you never, you never wanted to know how I got my name? <laughs> you, right there, and the, the lady with the, with the blue or navy, you never cared? You didn't fucking care? It just, you know, what, it's just meatloaf, that's what, okay, fine. <laughs> then put your fingers in your ears and don't listen to the story, okay? <laughs> so anyway, I was born in Dallas, Texas, and um, my father was a redneck policeman in Dallas. Yeah, yeah rednecks. <laughs> so, um, well, we've got one in the house back there, so... Um, uh, anyway, I'm born and I'm bright red. And this is, you know, like a couple of weeks ago I was born. So um, back then they didn't, when my daughter was born, she was bright red. They put her under some lights. She wasn't bright red. They used to leave babies in windows so the sun would hit them so they wouldn't be red anymore. 
But uh, my mother didn't want them doing that, so the doctor said, we'll just leave him in the hospital till he's not bright red. So my father goes up to the nursery where the nurses are, and it goes like this. My son there, he looks like nine and a half pounds of ground chuck. <laughs> now, I want you nurses to make up a sign that says meat, and I want you to put it on the front of that crib in that little plastic slot there. And they go, sir, we, we can't do Wait a second. You see this right here? See this badge? That means I'm a Dallas policeman. And you have to do exactly what I tell you to do. So you make up that sign that says meat. And you put it in that slot. And then you take that crib and you roll it right into the middle of the nursery so that when everybody comes up to see their baby, they see meat. <laughs> and so from that day, which was the fourth day I was alive, I have been called meat. And by everyone except my mother, who refused. And my wife, who also refuses. <laughs> now, um, so... Now you go the loaf. The loaf came about in the eighth grade playing football. And uh, I stepped on a coach's foot and he screamed, get off my foot, you hunk of meatloaf. Right? <laughs> so the next day I go into the locker room and on the lot, I'm sorry if you're bored. What, do you have, a, you, have a, you have a pass for that? You do? Okay, can we see it? Can you show everybody? Pass it around, okay? So anyway. Uh, I go into the locker room the next day, and on my locker, the name, my, my name had been taken down. It said meat on there, but it had the last name a day. And, and now it was meat, space, loaf, meatloaf. Because if I would have come up with that name as a stage name for, for anything, I should have been committed. And so, and I was doing, uh, I don't know if you, a lot of you know this or not, but I, I started as an actor. And the first film I was ever in was in 1958. And it was State Fair with Pat Boone and Ann Margaret. And I had one line. And uh, you clapping for Ann Margaret? Yeah, baby. <laughs> so uh, Pat looks a little older, Ann looks still good. So anyway, um, I had one line, they gave me one line. <laughs> well, fuck you too. <laughs> so anyway, I had, they gave me one line and Tom Yule was bringing his prize hog out into the middle of the, the room. And I said, look at that hog. That was it. <laughs> that was my break into show business right there. And, it, and, and, I don't, and then I don't know what happened after that. So anyway, I wanted to play football, but I couldn't. And, and now I'm sitting here in front of you, and I have no idea how I got here except by car. <laughs> and that's it. I don't know. I just, I just have d always done what I have done in this business, and I've always told the truth about whatever it is I'm doing. And bad out of hell, for those of you who own Bad Out of Hell or any of the records, I just want you to know that Bad Out of Hell is not about me. It's about you. And it's about your story and how you live your life. And if you all listen to Bad Out of Hell and write a report and we all get back together, every one of your stories will be completely different because it'll be about you, and you'll never see me inside that story. That's why I don't have my picture on a cover, ever. And if they do it, and I saw one today, and I'm gonna call the record company to put it on there and, and let them have it, because I, I need to keep it about you, all the records. They need to be about your life and about your experiences and how you can grow and how you can change if you need to change something. And that's what that's all about. So now the next one is, the next question, and this came as a bet. It came, Jim and I were in the studio, and uh, Jim Steinman, 
and uh, he said, you can applaud for Jimmy. Go ahead, baby. So um, he, said, um, he said to me, they're not going to know what that is. And I said, what, are you crazy? I said, of course they're going to know what that is. He goes, no, they're not. I said, I'll bet you $100. There's got, nobody's ever going to even question, what is that? Okay, after a million and a half times of being asked, what is that? I had to give Jimmy his hundred dollars. And uh, so, and people have come up with everything you can imagine, the most gross sexual things. What is going on over there? Should, I think we should all go over there. And so anyway, um, that, if you get the lyrics, if you go home, you look at the lyrics on anything for love, you'll see it. It's just that Jimmy went, I'll do anything for love, I'll do anything for love, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. And by the time you got to I won't do that, you forgot the line, I'll never forget the way you feel right now. And that was that at that moment. I'll never, whatever it is, there's nine of them. So it's not, I won't screw somebody in that you know where, <laughs> which everybody thought. So that was, those are the two major questions that I've been asked. Where'd you get your name, and what is that? So there you go, you got answers on those. Now, if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to grab a mic, that one right there, and ask me the question. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could tell Wait a second, what's your name? Okay. I'm Nick. I was wondering if you could tell the... What, 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 what's your name? Nick. Nick. Okay, Nick. Okay. Go ahead. Um, could you tell the tale of when you first saw uh, Tim Curry and his uh, costume? Because I saw... My father saw a documentary where you were, uh, were... That talked about how you first saw the yeah, costume. Yeah, I'll tell the story. Yeah. Shh, be quiet. <laughs> okay, so back in the early 70s when I was doing theater, I went into New York and started, I, my first show in New York was Hair on Broadway. And, and no, I didn't do the nude scene because they wanted to sell tickets, okay? So anyway, um, although I did a couple of times because I had to get under there because some really good looking women under that, that drape. And I had to see him, okay? So anyway, I'm confessing. So anyway, so now I've gone into, into uh, Washington, D.C. to do a uh, play, and I can't remember the name of it. And I, I literally walked in the door, put my bags down in my apartment, my phone rang, and the guy goes, hi, this is Brian Evnett, and I represent Lou Adler, and I knew who Lou Adler, if you don't know who Lou Adler is, Lou Adler is producer of Rocky Horror, but he also was the producer of Jan and Dean, Carol King, Mamas and Papas, Cheech and Chong, and I forget the rest of them, but we can go on forever, and he owns all of Sunset Strip. Okay, and so anyway, so they said there's a, there's a uh, play, that a musical that we would love for you to be in. I said, okay, and back then, when you're that young, you don't ask for a script. Somebody wants to give you a job? Yep, I'm there. I take it. How much am I getting paid? Great. Love it. So that was those days. Nowadays, it's completely different for me, okay? And um, so I said, I, he said, when can you come to L.A.? I said, when's the next flight? I'm packed. And literally, because my luggage was at the front door. And he said, no, no, we're coming. To, we, we just want to talk to you. So I said, okay. So I called Jim. I said, they're coming to talk to me about some play in L.A. And he goes, well, they, knew, they want you to sing? I said, no. He said, well, let, let's go sing. I said, yeah, cool. So what we did, we got three background singers. And um, one was from uh, Sesame Street. And uh, another one was from another musical. And they could all sing unbelievably. And so we did three Elvis songs. We did Jailhouse Rock. Uh, I can't remember the other two because I'm... I'm too young to remember those. So anyway, we did three songs, even though they didn't want us to sing. And uh, so then we sat down and we talked. And he said, 
we'd like you to do this play. And so I went, okay, cool. So they go, we're all hooking up in LA and we're gonna learn the music. And so they gave me a ticket. I went to LA, put me in a hotel, and you know, we eventually found an apartment and so forth and so on. So we're in the theater and we're doing nothing but learning music. Now there's, we only heard over at Frankenstein's place, Hot Batuti, you know, now, the, all the tame songs, you know, not, no big deal. Okay, so they say to us, it's about two weeks in, the, the lead is coming in tomorrow. His name is Tim Curry, he's coming from London. I said, great. So all of a sudden, they start playing this music, the back door is open, and in comes Tim with that motorcycle jacket, fishnet stockings, <laughs> high heels, garter belt, and singing, I'm a sweet transvestite. <laughs> and I get up and I go, no fucking way. <laughs> and I leave, I walk out, and they're chasing me down the street. And I'm going, no, no, don't, eat, no, don't, no. No, I ain't getting involved in anything. Because I hadn't been out of Texas that long. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, they go, wait, we're going to give you the script. Take it home and read it, because it's a comedy. Trust me. So I took it home, and I read it. And they go, you're going to play Eddie and Dr. Scott. So when you read the script, know you play both characters. I said, OK. And they go, you're going to do your own makeup. I said, OK. So, I, so they were giving me all this stuff. I'm on Hollywood Boulevard. And they're, giving me scripts and producers are running around. And so I take it home and I read it. And it's the first script that I'd ever, anybody had ever given me to read, right? And no, actually the second. And so I still didn't know really how to read scripts. I didn't know if it was good or it was bad or whatever. And it made me laugh a lot. So I went, well, it's funny. And so, and the, the part that made me laugh most of all was when Dr. Scott raised, in the second act, raised his blanket and put his leg in the air and he was wearing a fishnet stocking with a garter belt. <laughs> and I thought, now this will get a laugh. Because <laughs> I weighed about 295 pounds. And that was just this leg. <laughs> and, and, and so I said, this leg in a fishnet stocking with a high heel, oh, I'm gonna get a fucking laugh, man, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and every night, I've never heard laughter like that. I don't blame them, it's pretty fucking funny. So <laughs> anyway, and one Saturday night, Tim, who is the ultimate, ultimate professional, and I learned so much from him, and I'll tell you one, something else about that in a second. But one night on a Saturday night, Tim, you couldn't break him, one night, the laughter went on so long that out of the corner of my eye, I saw Tim start laughing, <laughs> which was like unbelievable. And I, I called him, I've been calling on him ever since 1970, whatever that was. And I've been calling, I saw him today, I said, you laughing? And so anyway, he didn't know what I was talking about, but that's okay. And so uh, I'm weird like that. I say things people don't know. What? What did he just say? It has, you know. So I went ahead and did it, and it was well worthwhile because Lou Adler um, and a guy by the name, the, the godfather of theater in New York named Joseph Papp, who had signed Jim Steinman to a contract to the public theater. Uh, so between this brilliant theater producer and this brilliant record man, record producer, they're the ones who really put Jim Steinman and myself together. And I think it paid off. Thank you. I think, I, I, I'm not through. <laughs> I, I, I'm not through and I'll give you, I'm gonna keep going on this one. Okay, stay there. And I'll tell you why I'm not through. See, we went to play Oklahoma, right? Just a few years ago. And we were supposed to open at this uh, um, reservation. All the reservations now are building arenas, anywhere from 10,000 to 16,000. 
Mohegan Sun up in Connecticut is 16,000. So we were going to open this arena, and it was 10,000, but it wasn't finished. And they came to me and said, the arena's not finished. They want to know if you'll play in a tent. And I said, yeah, I guess. And they go, well, the arena holds 10,000, and the tent holds 12. And, and I said, so you mean that I'll get 2,000 people in, and I'll get the percentage from those tickets? And they went, yeah. I said, I, absolutely, fucking yeah. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, we did that, and so the, they don't, they call them tribal leaders. So they came to me, and nobody comes in my dressing room, they don't dare. I'm like a monster before I go on, and because uh, I'm just getting into characters and doing all this stuff. And so they said, listen, the tribal leader wants to meet you. And so I said, fantastic. So he came in, he sat down, and I started talking to him, and I said, so, does everybody share in the, in the money here from the casino? He went, yeah. I said, have you improved the schools? you improved the medical? Have you improved all of that? He went, yes, we've done all of that. I said, you've improved the roads, housing is better? He said, yes. And I just kept asking him question after question after question. He says, can I interrupt you for a second? I said, yeah. And he said, do you mind if I give you a tribal name just for our tribe? And I went, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, that, what an honor that'll be. He'll go, okay, from now on, in our tribe, you're known as Never Shuts Up. <laughs> Which is absolutely right. So anyway, now sit down. <laughs> okay, now it's your question. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Get close Stephanie. to the mic. My name is Stephanie. And yeah. Longtime fan from way back, so you sing everything. I would like to know if you're how involved you are in the Bad Out of Hell play that's going to come on Broadway this week. How involved? Are you involved? Well, I I think I was pretty involved. <laughs> it seems to me, yeah. I just no, yeah. I I sing all those songs and <laughs> and we sold a lot of records and and uh, but if you want to know about the actual staging of it. Initially, no, but I went to see it in London, and I've become very good friends now with the producer, Michael Cole, and he said to me, when you saw it in London, what did you think? I said, you want the truth? He says, absolutely. I said, the second act is absolutely brilliant. The whole thing is great, but if you don't know the music, and you're coming in cold off the street, and maybe on the radio you've heard anything for love, or you might know something bad out of hell or rock and roll dreams. And if you don't go back that far, maybe you know, you know, something from else from that too or something, then you're gonna get a little lost. And I said, what you need to do is you've taken a lot of the storyline out of the first act. So people don't know what the hell is going on. And he said, you really think so? I said, no, I don't think so, I know so. And so I said, what you need to do is go put more of, uh, hi, how are you? So anyway, um, the, uh, you need to put more of Jim's dialogue, because Jim writes that stuff like, on a hot summer night, would you offer your throat to the wolf with the red roses? Well, when you see it in a play form, you actually, and this is true, and I'm not joking you, you actually realize that Jim Steinman is like a Shakespeare of, of now. It's like mind-boggling. So, so, yes, I've had a lot more input, input to it going into Broadway. So I'm hoping they're, they, they've called me up and said, we've got all your notes, we're putting them in, we're doing it. So I don't know if they're lying to me or not, but we're going to find out, aren't we? So I don't think they're going to tell me that and then not do it because they know I'll come after them. <laughs> so the play is absolutely brilliant, and yes, I've had a lot to do with it. Okay? Six weeks, though. Is it going to go any longer, do you know? Or if it's a hit, success, which I'm sure it will I be. Think it'll, I think it's almost sold out for the six weeks, yeah. and it'll go longer. It'll go longer. And, and they, uh, there was, they were going to do a tour, and they were putting tickets on sale, and I said... You're doing it. That's wrong. Don't do it that way. That's the wrong thing. 
to do. And so I read on my Facebook, oh, we had tickets to Indianapolis, but they canceled it. Yeah, Facebook, they always, somebody's got something nasty to say. They don't. But there was a reason for that. And, and it was to improve the play. Don't take it to Indianapolis unless it's better. And you always want to make everything better. Like whenever I do a show, I want the next night to be better than the night before. I want, I, I live for that. And some nights, these songs, you know, they're not, they're not your typical Chuck Berry. I mean, I could sing Chuck Berry 19 shows a week, okay? But Jim Steinman's songs and go four octaves. And, and I don't, and when they say like, oh, what's her name? I can't remember her name now. She sings four octaves. Yeah, she goes into her falsetto for four octaves. I sing four octaves full on, hit me hard, baby. You know, who did that? Britney Spears. Yeah, but she lip syncs. Oh, never mind. <laughs> so, um, um, you know, and so I would get a little hoarse. So that was a drag. But I went on stage in 103 fever in Houston. I refused to cancel. So there's been nights I should have canceled that I didn't. And, you know, people hate me for that. But that's the way it goes. At least I went on. If I didn't go on, they'd hate me for not going on. And if I went on and the show wasn't what, exactly what it was, they hated me for that. So you can't win as a performer. They hate you either way. They either love you or hate you. You know what I mean? That's how it is. That's life. I love you. That's okay. I love you too. But that's life. That's, that, that's, that's all your life. That's, that's, that's life. They're going to love or hate you. Everybody in this room. You're going to do something that they hate or you're going to do something that they love. And if you're not on Facebook, you don't know about it. <laughs> Hi. Hey, me. This is Joe. You know, that's really Stop. fucking weird what you're wearing. Thank you. You said, that, you said the same thing when we had our picture. That's made. right, but all these people weren't here. She's I couldn't part. get as big a laugh. Yeah, right. She's still part of my question, but I was in Toronto on business when the Sh Bad Out of Hell musical was there. Yeah. Didn't know it was going to be there. Walked down just about. Yeah, because you don't have a Toronto accent. I can tell you yeah, that. Yeah. So, okay. Do we, know, do we know when it's going to start in New York? Yeah. The first of August. First of August. Previews. Okay. They call them previews. Right. They're short previews. When I did Broadway, we used to do like five, six weeks of previews, and then we'd open. Right. And it was a drag, because what you'd have to do is you'd have to show up every morning at 10 o'clock for rehearsal, and you rehearse all day. They'd break you for dinner, and then you'd have to come back at, at what they call half hour. So if the show started at 8, you had to be there at 7.30. I was always there two hours before, because that's just me. And, and then you do a show. So in previews, you're tired, and you want them to end quick. And, uh, but I was in one, <laughs> I was in a Broadway show called Soon. And as soon as it opened, it closed. <laughs> that's a true story. That's my favorite joke, too. So anyway, that happened. I was in another one called Rockabye Hamlet, and it was directed by a, a, a director and he's passed away now. His name was Goward Champion. And, and they, he liked my voice, and he stuck me in Hamlet. You can't just put a character in the middle of Hamlet. And so, because it just stopped the show. It just stopped the movement of the play. And he, because he liked my voice. And so I was the priest. And if you read Hamlet, the priest shows up at the, very, at the beginning and marries the king and queen. And then he's at the funeral and he does the ceremony for Olivia's uh, um, uh, funeral. And so that's the priest. So they built the priest into, into Rockabye Hamlet, and I had six songs. And so the play just stopped. I had like song like Get Thee to a Nunnery, and oh, stupid. So, and I'm going, oh, thank God we're opening because this thing's going to close. And they put together the cast for a meeting, and they all got together, and they said, we got great news for all of you. We've got money, and we're going to keep running for at least another six weeks. And I went, oh, man. <laughs> and so I knew I couldn't, they couldn't replace me in six weeks. So I suffered through another six weeks of that. So soon in Rockabye Hamlet, 
And I, I did some good ones, but one of them was Rocky Horror, and I yeah. love that one. Yeah. And that was on Broadway, yeah. but they blew it because they, when we did it to Roxy, nobody knew what it was. Right. So they left it alone when they took it on Broadway and just kind of snuck it in. Right. Exactly. We'd still be running. Yep. Yeah, that thing would still be going. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Ben. Uh, Your name's what? Ben. Ben, okay. Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, do you have any uh, memory of doing a movie called Scavenger Hunt back in the day? Or any stories about that? Uh, you're asking me if I have any memory? Well, you might. <laughs> what do you think, I've been doing drugs for the last 67, 80 years? What? Uh, of I'm course I have memory of doing Scavenger Hunt. It was directed by Richard Benjamin, who was, was a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is that it? Pretty much. I just... Oh, okay. I like well, that movie. was one hell of a question. <laughs> I like the movie, and I enjoyed your story. Wasn't that it? like an, an inspiring question? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> hey, Ben, go next door and ask them the same question. <laughs> Hi, my name's Steven. And I wanted to say, first off, that Bad Out of Hell has been the soundtrack to a lot of late night drives. Um, but my question is, and I realize you might not be able to talk about this, can you talk about your experience doing Fight Club? Do you know the first rule of Fight Club? <laughs> I, I can't tell you that, sir. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for your question. What? I'm Baronessa. What? Exactly. <laughs> what? My name is Baronessa. Oh, Vanessa. Bern Vanessa? Baronessa. Vanessa. Okay. Uh, I'm actually asking a question that my mom wanted to ask because she couldn't come to meet you. Um, oh, I thought she was out there and didn't want to come up. <laughs> oh, God, I'm not walking up to that microphone. It's too far. Okay, go ahead. She wanted to know, did you do that? Well, you can tell your mom that she did that. <laughs> because you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Kersey. You got a lot of nerve coming up here with that hair. <laughs> Especially around me. Okay, go ahead. Um, well, I am a musician as well. Each time I listen to your records, I'm constantly re-inspired by all the little influences that I can hear in those songs. And I was just curious, and each time I listen to them, I get a whole range of emotions. But um, Exactly what you should, because it doesn't, you're asking me a question that I know nothing about, because that record, that's your inspirations. Right. Those, um, that, that's your stuff. Right. So that what, doesn't belong to me. You can take... Take, go home, get bad out of hell, whatever you got it on, take a piece of tape, cover up my name, and write your name on the top. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, go ahead. But, so, when you were coming up and starting your career, what, what did you listen to that gave you those feelings that re-inspired you every time you listened to it? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I, 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 I was inspired by my own thoughts and my own inspiration. And that's where I, I done, you know, I didn't, I guess if there was anybody, it would be Bob Dylan, and that was it, because I loved his lyrics. And it's all, of, songs are about lyrics, and, and they seem to have forgotten that in the last 20 years. <laughs> songs, songs are about lyrics. And there was, they started to forget it in the 80s, there was a few of them that didn't, you know. I, I love John, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Absolutely, John. Um, so, uh, Bon Jovi, if you didn't get the rest of it. Um, so, um, you know, they, they, they cared about lyrics. And then uh, uh, Kurt Cobain did, and Kurt Cobain in Rolling Stone, he actually said that Meatloaf and Jim Steinman 
were one of his major inspirations. So at that point, I loved Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you know, they, they've stopped caring about lyrics. They don't care. There's a few, but not many. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I hope if in your band you care about lyrics. <laughs> I like to think that I do. Okay, good. Okay. It's not about... You mean it's not just... I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Brian. Hi, and, Brian. Um, Good, they let you out and you remembered your name. Thank you. I, hey, right now, that's amazing. Uh, so one of my favorite movies of all time is actually Leap of Faith. And I've had several arguments about what the meaning and the purpose of that movie was, and I was wondering. Uh, I'm still you... trying to figure that out, okay. because let me let me just explain this to you. Yeah. When you do a film, and they will change the script okay. a lot, not not all movies a lot, but when they change the script, they change the color. The original script will be in white, and then they'll go to blue pages, and then they might go to pink pages, and I don't see pink, so it looks like white, but um, then they, you know, they keep changing. They ran out of colors in that movie. Oh, wow. They were into triple rainbow chartreuse purple. I have never been so upset at a movie in my life, and so was Steve, and so was Deborah Harry, not Deborah Harry, Deborah Winger, and uh, the entire cast was ready to shoot somebody. And I, 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 in those situations, I become very calm. So I would, I would deal with everybody. Steve is a calming influence as well. But I would deal with everybody and go, look, let's just, let's just deal with it, you know? I, I, believe it or not, as angry as I can get, and I can get very angry, but I am also a very calming influence. when when the feathers start to get ruffled. But that was an insane movie. How that movie was supposed to end was Steve Martin came to me, knocked on my motel room door. I have the original script. And he said, I'm leaving. And I want you to take over. And so he handed me his Bible and his rosary beads or whatever. And he said, and, and I've, had a, I've had the outfit made in your size because I was bigger. And, and so he gives me all this, and, and the movie ended with me on stage with the audience going, I want you to know that if you believe here today that I will save you, and all it's going to take you to do, all it's going to take you to do is you send me $3. All I need is $3. And all your wishes will come true. But if you add two more and make it an even five dollars, I promise you that whatever you want will be yours. And here's Craig to tell you about it. Thank you, Reverend Smith. He's telling you the truth. I sent him five dollars and I got me a new Buick just last Saturday. So thank you, Reverend Smith. So there you go. And if you, on Leap of Faith, the one thing that I did love, if you watch it and you see the, just the audience, right, and their reactions, and you don't see anything else but the audience and what the reactions, the preacher on stage doing the preaching is me. And so Paramount, on the first dailies that went back, they went, wow, who'd you get to be the preacher? And they said, that's Meatloaf. They went, what? They go, yeah, that's Meatloaf. So that's, that's kind of what I was doing, a little different. I wasn't, you know, I was, I was trying to get them to give me money. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead. Hi, so I grew up um, listening to your music, specifically when my mom wanted us to clean, she would play all your all your songs. You can't clean a house <laughs> listening to my music. No, that's, she played it all the time, and so now in my dorm when I'm cleaning, I have to listen to your music or like some other music she played. But like, so her favorite song was Paradise by the Dashboard Light, and she wanted to know, 
she wanted to know, she's always like wondered what was the inspiration behind that or like what, what do you think about when you're singing that song? <laughs> okay, two things. One thing is, Jim will never tell you why he wrote a song. I will never tell you what the character is doing because that's not what it's about. It's about what you get out of it. So I'm not gonna influence your thinking in any way whatsoever. What I'm thinking about though is grabbing her tits. That's what I'm... <laughs> that's it. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is John. I know. <laughs> I've and seen I, you like four times today. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you if you would tell the story of how you would go to demo Bat Out of Hell and how you got kicked out on Broadway and Fourth. Oh, you mean Clive Davis? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Okay, Clive Davis. Do you know who Clive Davis is? Whitney Houston. I mean, he was... You know, he was probably, he was the president of CBS and then started Arista and, you know, had, I don't know, Michael Bolton, I don't know who. Anyway, so Clive, he's, has a bit of an ego, which I, I guess he's entitled to. Um, if, it, if I was him, I wouldn't have that, but that's okay. Um, so anyway, we... We didn't do demos of these songs. These songs are impossible to demo. How are you gonna demo Bat Out of Hell? Right, you don't. So we used to just go to people's offices and sing live. And Jim would play the piano and I would sing. And uh, we went to Clive's and everybody hated it. <laughs> I'm telling you, everybody hated it and going, what the hell are you two doing? What, what, is, what, what? Do you, what are you doing? That's a 10 minute song. Who's gonna play that? So anyway, just to let you know, um, the other day, the president, who's not president now, but he was at the time of Epic Records, says, I know it says 44 million or 45 million, but I'm gonna tell you the truth, your record, Bad Out of Hell, has sold 60 million copies. So, so. So the guys that ask, what the hell is that 10 minute song? You people know what it's about. So anyway, Clive, we sang for Clive and he stopped us. And he, he looks at Jim and he goes, do you know anything about songwriting? And he, that, that started to piss me off, right? And he goes, you know songwriting goes, verse, Bridge, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, chorus, chorus. And that's it. A, B, C. And he says, your songs go A, Z, Y, G, F, R, D. And he's doing this, and I'm getting, I'm getting madder. And I, I mean, I'm really, I bet there was smoke coming out of my ears. Because this guy is insulting. Jimmy is my brother. I mean, he's not lit my real brother, but he is my real brother. So I'm not gonna let anybody sit there and insult my brother like that. And so then he turns on me and he says, and you, you're like Ethel Merman. <laughs> and so I went, well, that's not bad. I love Ethel Merman. <laughs> and then he went, and Robert Goulet. And I went, Robert Goulet? <laughs> of, and I said, Jim, we're leaving. And Jim goes, well, no, wait, wait, wait. Jim's very quiet. I, Jim, we're leaving. I look at him and I said, fuck you. And I walked out and I'm down. It's 5.30 in the afternoon. And if you know New York City, Broadway, New York City, 5.30 in the afternoon, it's like insanity on the streets. But I am in the middle of the street like some wino, you know, <laughs> and screaming at the top of my lungs up, fuck you, fuck you. And so, Okay, I'm gonna continue the story. Now, bad out of hell has, don't give me a signal. Don't, don't, don't even think about giving me a signal like my time's up. Go, go sit down. 
My time will be up when I'm finished. Hey, I go on to a show, the contract says 90 minutes. I'm up there for almost four hours. So anyway, um, the uh, Jimmy, uh, Clive, then Bat became a hit, right? So I go to a party at the New York Public Library for Do an artist named Dobie Gray, who I love. And, uh, and Clive comes up to me and he puts his arms on my shoulders and he goes, I knew you could do it. I knew you could do it. That, you know, and I, just, I went, okay, I'll see you later, dude. <laughs> so, and, but then, I, you know, Clive was on the NBC show, you know, what is it, NBC Today, Tomorrow, some show, morning show, and they did a retrospective, and he was on five days in a row. And on the last day, one of his last questions, they asked him, he, they asked him this, they said, is there an artist that you regret not having signed? And he said, yeah, meatloaf. And so I went, okay, all's forgiven. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So I called him up and I invited him out to lunch at the Four Seasons. <laughs> and we went. And so he's invited me. So any, I'm going to do a couple more questions, and then they're going to make me go away. But I love you. But OK, two more questions. Don't go away yet. If there were two pieces of your work, one movie, one album, I could recommend to a friend to say, this is, the one, this is what I would recommend starting with. What would you recommend? There isn't. There isn't. There isn't. Life continues to move. And everything continues to change. Just like it would be saying to you when you were six, how'd you do? So for you, your life, I hope, I have a thing that I do and I live by. I have to learn something new every day. And so life progresses and you want to progress with it. And you want to go with it and have the knowledge that goes with it. Now, I'm going to, sorry, I can't answer your questions, but I need to do this. Okay. I'm going to stand up and look at all of you. And I'm going to say to you, my heart, I say to all of you, thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Because without you, I have no inspiration, and I have no reason to live, and I love all of you as much as I possibly can, and I say to all of you, thank you. <laughs>